You are about to listen to the Never Daily Podcast. This is the biggest thing since the Zaprota film. So many questions. I don't have any answers. But please, please don't stop listening to the Never Daily Podcast. Welcome to the QVC Network, where all of your shopping needs are met and exceeded. Today, we're going to be looking at an agate necklace made in Bulgaria. You can't say that. Agate? I can can say it all I want. Oh, man. How, uh, how you doing? How am I? Well, it's 500 fucking degrees here, Op. How, are, how the hell are you doing? I'm doing all right. It's 52 degrees because I accidentally left my AC on in my studio all night. There's no thermostat. We got a, <clears throat> an 830-pound German Shepherd that now can't go outside longer than five minutes at a time. And now there's, so there's basically a rhinoceros moving through the house at all points of the day. How are you doing, Op? I'm doing better than that. I watched a... Uh, Body cam YouTube video yesterday. It took place in, I want to say it was like, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's Ohio, uh, Wisconsin somewhere. Lady had a pit bull. Man, talk about a video that just, the comments were on freaking fire. Here's the scene. Cop is called to a little, little part of town. Sort of an urban ish setting you know there's you like a, it was a market. pit bull what pit bull yeah you said it was a pit bull a pit bull yeah it's probably in a, uh, an apartment complex <laughs> <laughs> yeah so she bought she bought this pit bull it was like two and a half or three years old at the time and it got off its yeah. it don't know it didn't get off its chain it it she said it broke through a six foot privacy fence and then was causing just wreaking havoc on the town, but like biting people and everything. She couldn't get it back mm. in. And she made the, t- I love it when the, when the, the, the suspect like shrinks the timeline down to like, they're trying to take, ca- I'm trying to take care of my, my expired license right now. I'm on the way to the DMV right now. You know, it's always yeah. like they're fixing it right when they get caught. And she's like, I was preparing meat and, and, um, uh, Benadryl potatoes. to try to knock it out because apparently she was saying that the the Humane Society wouldn't take it to put it down uh, that doesn't sound right and then she says she's called the cops eight times and they never come but now the dog's out wreaking havoc eating everybody and the cops show up This, but it was so maddening because the cops are like uh, there's people on the street and they're, they're like, they're like, why aren't you doing something? And the cop's like, what do you want me to do? And they're like, shoot it. And he's like, I'm not going to shoot the dog. And, uh, and then, and then it's, it's literally biting people. And then it opens up the back of the arm of a police officer. And the guy's like, I'm not tasing the dog. I'm like, tase the dog. You know, it just keeps biting people. The comments what a com- were just What like, a confusing time to be a police officer. Oh, oh, well, okay. So that's that's part of the problem is there was such a crowd that was growing that suddenly the police officers get real quiet. And, you know, you can hear them from their body cams, but they're like mumbling to each other. Like, you know, we got to be careful with this one. Got to be careful with this one. You know, because the optics, everybody, you know, they're under a microscope now. Humane society, the, the, the dog, the, the pet people, the humane society won't come to the scene. They've got rules, apparently. Like, you know, those cops have had nightmares about this exact scenario. The, guy, the one guy's got a bite that went down to the bone. He's he's getting all wrapped up. This other cop, you can tell he's must be like a an extreme dog lover because he's just not interested in doing anything to this dog and it's biting people, attacking people. She, yeah, the, you've got to at some point. The owner's running around swearing at the cops, like <laughs> trying to get the dog. Oh, and the dog has cornered a minivan 
that's stuck in the road and there's a dog inside of the minivan and somehow the owner knows that dog and that that dog's in heat and so the pit bull just wants into the minivan cops won't let it happen because there's a driver in the minivan and they're like we're not going to let a monster inside with that guy and it was just oh it was a scene the and it, almost at sometimes i was just watching the comments in real time you know, instead of watching the video because people were losing their absolute minds. It was like Hatfields and McCoy suddenly. It was like everybody was like, shoot the dog. And then other people were like, how dare you? It's not the dog's fault. You know, oh, man, I had such anxiety. You know, a dog is scary when it's cornered a minivan. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, OK. And the, so they when finally it's cornered. The one thing that's killed more dogs than, <laughs> um, than who was that football player? Damn it. Oh, yeah, the one with the, with the dog fighting habit, the dog fighter. Uh, um, um, that's just, that's a situation <clears throat> for Vic, my, yeah, Michael police Vic. officers, Michael Vick. I I feel like that's a situation that police officers have nightmares about. Like the only difference in this and their nightmare is in the nightmare they're naked. (laughs) They're completely naked. Yeah. So this was. Uh, I'm a pit bull lover. Our last dog that passed away was a pit bull, actually. Yeah. Um. (laughs) They're not all violent, but this is clearly one of those cases where you kill the dog. I think if it's been a bunch of people, you're bleeding from your inside on your arm just kill the dog there's there are i'm not even gonna i'm not gonna wade into the world of pit bull logic or or not because i i think i burned all of my listener equity after pleading my case on why billionaires aren't solving the planet i don't know if you saw the comments there so i'm staying away from pit bulls. but i will say i th- this lady people was upset with you or me what what People were upset about the billionaires? Oh, no. You said, I wish rich people would do more with their money. And all everybody was like, well, I I can get behind that. And then I was just trying to explain why billionaires aren't trying to solve the world's problems. And I caught hell for that. You know, I'm I'm the bastard capitalist now. But uh, I digress. Um, The... uh, the 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 thing is this lady was in no way someone that nurtured a pit bull from its youth to be a good dog you know what i mean and yeah. so i mean this this whole situation was just rife with failure they finally got it in the back of they had like a paddy wagon you know the the police had an animal control paddy wagon they got the dog into it and then you hear one of the cops go well uh we've got a problem now because the Humane Society won't receive the dog while it's in the patio. It's still our responsibility. We have to get it out somehow out of the paddy wagon into the Humane Society. That right there, right there, that reminded me. What was the Humane Society's reason for not wanting to take care of this problem? They said it just wasn't their problem. Especially since the police had our okay, I don't, I don't know, I don't know all the intricacies of the case, but Humane Society wouldn't show up on the scene. Okay, wouldn't show up on the scene. The police took control of the scene, so I don't know if that checked a box for the Humane Society saying we don't. Okay, our jurisdiction's been over over ruled or whatever. And then the police took custody of the dog. And so the, I don't know, the Humane Society was like, because you have custody of the dog, it's your responsibility to transport and then your responsibility to get it out of the car into our facility. Uh, Just a wild scene, just one, one, kind of just one failure after another. But that part right there where the, the Humane Society wasn't going to, wasn't taking care of the animal that that's their job reminded me of the problem I think we could we'll see when we start putting counselors on scene of 911 calls like I, they're they're not there's a reason that humane society 
has different tools that they use when they're, you know, when they're on scene and stuff. They can trank an animal, you know, they can, the police aren't prepared, aren't equipped with that. They can kill an animal, <laughs> but this, yeah. this animal, they emptied two things of pepper spray on this dog and it did not d- d- deter the dog at all. That is a, that is Yeah, a, you just, you kill the dog. I, uh, that's that's where and look i'm a dog lover i'm an animal lover everybody knows this but i was also raised in the country where i mean whenever i where i was raised we didn't take dog like say a dog got like the farm i grew up on you know dogs get old and they get hip dysplasia and they start to where they can't get around yeah my papa and my family never took dogs to the vets you loved your dog and yeah taking it to a animal shelter and and having somebody else kill it was disrespectful. So where I grew up, whenever a dog got to the point where it couldn't get around anymore and it was at a point where it's more, you know. Humane. Uh, sh- humane to kill it. Yeah. You took it out to the woods and you did the old, what was in of mice and men, look at the flowers. Yeah. Look at the pretty flowers. Yeah. And then you killed it. You shot it in the head. Well, and I'm sure. I mean, it was love. It was because you loved it. You didn't want it to suffer. This is like the same kind of thing. Not like if I was a cop here, I would have definitely left a lot of young people scarred (laughs) because I think the correct is like, oh, I see the situation. It's got a van cornered. (laughs) It's already bit like nine people and the owner is saying, kill it. Kill it! I was so frustrated because this dog kept biting, pe- like, you know, grabbing on and then doing the whole shake your head and tear. And the cop that they had them that, you know, you have you, the video is ba- based on whatever body cam they choose to to film it, you know, that they're they're putting the, the perspective from. And that cop would not change his level of alert at all. Like somebody else would get bit and he'd just be like, he'd be like, all right, well. Um, all right. Hey, you come over here. You're in the way. You're in the way, you know, or I was just like, no, you know, he re- I, the, the, the thing is the headline for this is there is no good headline that was going to come from this. Right. It's either going to be no, cop kills dog, lose, lose, totally lose, 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 lose. And I mean, <laughs> it just, oh, it just an absolute meltdown. And then. I'll just say in that for me, it would have been like that, you know, that scene in Napoleon Dynamite when the bus pulls away. <laughs> the cow by the bus. The, 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 <laughs> yeah. It's just a bunch of cows. Just, What's the problem here, people? They, and I'm like, oh, okay. And just walk up and cap it in the face. <laughs> Everybody starts screaming. I'm like, what? You all I want ag- me to stop? It's- I agree that, you know, I, I agree with the premise that a dog is as only as as safe as as its upbringing um but when a dog is not safely brought up then you've got a problem on your hands you know and i well, don't there's a i don't know the there's science. the phrase you can't teach an old dog new tricks yeah Even well that I was kind of a question really i had believe is that is that a like is there much science or is there much rigor behind people saying no there's rehabilitative effects for a pit bull that is raised this way like Uh, there are to a certain extent yeah i'm not a dog professional but um, i think that at a certain point if a dog especially and people get i love pit bulls i've had pit bulls all my life um and people are this is a touchy subject for some people but um pit bulls are um i feel like more easily prone to aggression yeah um that doesn't make them bad dogs they're smart they're great dogs they can be great family dogs but you just have to work with them and i do feel like a pit bull if you get to a pit bull and it's a little older and it's been abused its whole life and it doesn't know anything but being aggressive there's i think there's a less opportunity for success in teaching it I think this pit bull should have been put down. That's what I'm saying. And yeah. that's going to chaff yeah. a lot of asses, but whatever. It is what it is. Well, and, you know, it becomes whataboutism really quick because um, 
it's not the only aggressive breed out there. You know, it's 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 kind of. <laughs> It's kind of like, uh, you know, there's a lot of other breeds out there that are just happy to see the pit bulls take all the brunt, you know, because you have a German shepherd that I that I would put on the list of most dangerous animals I've ever f- had in my face. <laughs> but again, it comes yeah, down he's, to uh, the way they're raised. He's that's the thing about Bruno is. On the outside, people just see this violent, aggressive murderer, but inside the yeah. house, when it's just our family, he's a big teddy, you know, he yeah. he would absolutely kill somebody over the girls. That's true. I, I But he was so confounded all night long with why I'm in your bedroom. Like, his snout was underneath your door, like, 3 a.m., 3.15, you know, he was like, I don't understand. Yeah. Why Why did they just let this guy in? Why is he in the room? He's in the room, people. <laughs> exactly. You got to come out of there. Eventually, bitch. <laughs> I just, the sun's I just, coming up. I know you're in there. I just smell you. I just remember uh, the look on your face was so sincere when you were like, I'm going to close this door and you can't open it until I open it. <laughs> it felt like that movie where I was so nervous <laughs> when you were on your knees in the kitchen. Oh, right. And he put his face up to yours. I I think my heart stopped beating. Yeah. I was just like, it was like the whole world froze for a moment. And I didn't know either A, you were getting ready to make a friend or B, you were getting ready to join the lady that owned Travis the Chimp. <laughs> exactly. I was at that moment. I was accepting the possibility that I may be needing reconstructive surgery. Oh boy! No, but I don't know what's made him like that, because that's just in him. Because he's never known anything but love, and I mean, aside from, <clears throat> and he wasn't abused or anything when, from the people we got him from. It's just she was a breeder. She got COVID. Yeah. Went right when he was born. And this was when COVID was first kicking off. And so because she was so sick, Bruno just didn't get that human interaction that is like crucial in those early stages of development. Yeah. And now the only people he give a fuck, he gives a fuck about whether they live or die is his family and everybody else is a threat to him. Yeah. So and we yeah. and this is after. Two years of dog training. Oh God! By the way, yeah, yeah, he's a. So if a dog th- like this pit bull that you're talking about never even had the family aspect to latch on to, I don't know if he's he's repairable. I don't know if he's. Yeah, I don't think he's fixable. <clears throat> watched a watched a video the other day of a guy who swears up and down that the alligator that he's raised will never hurt him. And, you know, the alligator, like, lays on him and stuff. But the alligators always... Remember when you were talking about, was it snakes? How they they lay next to you to size up if they could eat you whole or not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, that's kind of... The angle the alligator's always at seems to be like, you know, it's not a loving angle. It's, like, always at this angle, like, you just, just stop paying attention to me for one sec. I'm going to... You know, finish you off. I got to do some measurements here. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Oh, man. Animals, animals, animals. Snakes are the most boring pets in the world. Yeah, unless... It's like having a little colorful poop that you have to feed. Yeah, that, that, see, that right there is one of the, I think, the amazing things about humans is that we are so diverse in what we love and why we love it. You know, it's, yeah, it's pretty, I've had snakes never understood. I had one, I think I talked about this growing up. I had a ball python. Um, I was probably like 14 or 15 and we kept it for a long time, but I just remember like a week after I wanted a snake my whole life. And I remember having one in my room, this ball python and looking at it, it was all curled up and that's really all it had done since we got it aside from eat a mouse. And I remember thinking like, 
This feels anticlimactic. <laughs> this is, I just realized this is all they, they do, isn't it? They just exist. It's a hungry rope. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, you, the thing is, you hope that it's always anticlimactic because the climactic part you don't want to be around for. Uh, oh, I watched a video the other day of a guy who's really into spiders and he had this one, it was a tarantula type and it was crawling on him. And he's like, watch this. If I tilt my hand and he was basically tilting his hand. So it wasn't a, a, a plane that it could sit, stand on anymore, but more of a wall that it had to hang from. He's like, watch this. And he tilts his hand and the tarantula just takes its fangs and just digs him like, you know, bites him, just digs him into his hand. And he's like, yeah, He's like, isn't that interesting? Like it, when it starts to lose grip, it just uses its fangs to hold on. He's like, ha ha, weird. And, you know, and then it was like a couple minutes before he's like, it's not injecting venom. You know, like it. I, I didn't know that, that they have an op, they have the option to know whether or not they're going to inject venom or not. But yeah, he's like, no, it's just holding on. But I was like, yeah, but, but why are you doing it? <laughs> it's crazy. I had to babysit a tarantula one time. Oh. How do you do that? Shout out Sanford. Just. Well, you just look at it. You just, it was, he was going away. My buddy was going away. He had to go to do some training. <clears throat> and it was while I was in the military and I had a house and he's like, hey, I can't feed this thing while I'm gone for a few months. Can you keep it? So I babysat the tarantula. It was actually really cool. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. They're very sweet little things. And they're actually, I would say tarantulas, more fun than snakes. I think one thing that that becomes a component of our love for animals is like the way that we kind of wrap our head around what we think is beautiful. Because I think beauty in a lot of cases uh, makes up for, uh, you know, makes the dis makes up the difference for how interactive or less interactive an animal is. You know, there are some... What's cool about tarantula, well, all spiders, is... Did you know that their bodies work like hydraulics? Oh, no. They move, they they close and open their legs and arms by injecting liquid into their... It's just like hydraulics. Really? That's how their little bodies work. No, I guess that makes sense. They're... And that might not be true. Well, I, I think you're right. I mean, without I that somewhere, without a soft body, there that exoskeleton probably wouldn't be moving based on tendons or muscle structures. That makes eh, that makes sense. Makes sense. I also learned spiders aren't scary. Snakes aren't scary. Um, it's how they're portrayed. In the media. Yeah. <laughs> I I just like when people are like, sharks aren't scary. I'm like, no, you're... Sharks are fucking scary. You're wrong. <laughs> sharks are terrifying. Yeah. It's like a, a shark is basically <clears throat> a roaming buzzsaw in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Just... It's a buzzsaw with fins. And that's like the scariest thing ever when you can't see underneath you. Yeah. They, they, they don't know why, but there's a beach in Florida that the, the shark attacks are off the charts. Like they can't figure out why this beach has never had this problem. And then suddenly just heaven's been going on about this for days. Really? Okay. She's been following the shark thing very closely. She's like, the sharks fucking know something. <laughs> they know something. Because she's also following the sharks' migration patterns oh, and yeah, shit. Yeah. She's, like, she's like, their patterns are all fucked up. They know something. We don't. <laughs> and I'm like, heaven, it's probably just undercurrents or the weather or humidity. I don't, I don't know. So, ah! <laughs> what is going on here? There's a. Do you know about the... Well, she must know about on O-Search, O C E. A R C H C H O search dot org. There's a shark tracker, and you can you can go and find your favorite shark where the shark is at any given time on the map. It it has a model. You have a favorite shark, huh? Yeah, like you. Do you have a favorite shark? Well, yeah, my favorite's a uh, deep blue. It's uh, the largest great white shark ever filmed, and it's uh, 
Let me see if I can find out where it's. <laughs> <There's>... <laughs> this is fun. If you just hover over the map, all their names are there. And I just was like, there's one named Beat. What's what's its name? Where do you go to for this? So O Search, O like Ocean, O C E A R C H, O Search dot org forward slash tracker, uh, and you can <laughs> you can you can find find all the there. They all have different names. There's one here. It's a hammerhead, uh, eight feet ten inches long, named B P Armstrong. <laughs> <laughs> There's another one here named Doug. It's a tiger shark, currently oh, nine feet, nine inches long. It's currently down in the Caribbean. But uh, wow, look at this. Isn't that wild. Like they are, they are all That's there. That's cool as hell. And it's, I'm going to follow. Yeah. And you, and then, yeah. And then you can click on one and you can follow it. So you can get alerts on when it's. I picked my favorite. What was your favorite? His name is Duke. He's seven foot, 11 inches long, and 205 pounds. And right now, he is roaming around in the North American basin. And it's so it's so wild to be able to, to do that, you know? Um, I, I, love it. I love it. I love it. This is really cool. Heaven's going to love this. So oh, she can, yeah. This is going to really help her um, conspiracy theories. It also it also follows turtles too. So there's some some turtles. And if you thought sharks were big, there's a turtle currently off the Florida coast named Windy. It's a female, five feet two inches in size, nine hundred and sixteen pounds. That is a big turtle. I'm trying to find deep blue. Hmm. Let's see animal groups. There we go. Sharks. I really want this episode to be over so I can just look at this. I know. <laughs> for... It's pretty amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm in love with it. I love it. There's 371 sharks currently being tracked. You Oh, sharks, dolphins, seals, turtles, alligators. So those are all the things that they track. They're tracking uh, three alligators right now. <laughs> Jessica came up in here looking like a librarian. <laughs> Sally, uh, yeah, Audrey Lane, and Cypress. Oh, all of them, I, these got to be in Florida. Where are these? In the Everglades, probably. Yeah, uh, right north uh, north of Jacksonville. But it, that's, it's fun. It's fun. I just really oh, like look it. Look at this. Carolyn, the sea turtle. Kikoa out in... Uh, out in uh, Hawaii. So it's just fun. If you ever want to just w- like blow a whole day. I got to. F- I... That's what's going to happen now. Thanks a lot for this. <laughs> Carolyn stays mostly, it seems, uh, Carolyn the sea turtle. She's three foot three inches long, 250 pounds, female. <laughs> um, it seems like she stays mostly on the coast of uh North and South Carolina. What a good girl. I bet she's a sweet girl. Trying to, oh, they might not be tracking Deep Blue anymore. I don't know that they are. Is that... I hope he's okay. Here's Doug, a tiger shark. <laughs> no, Doug. That was my favorite one. <laughs> he's, uh, <laughs> he's in the Caribbean <clears throat> Sea. Let's see what Doug's been up to. Yeah, the last time. Oh, damn, Doug gets around, bro. Oh, and you can, yeah, and you can see their 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 trail their path. You can see, yeah, where they go. Yeah, the path. It's it's wild. Anyway, osearch dot org forward slash tracker if you want to track a bunch of animals in the ocean. The only other thing that I think is almost as deep of a uh, rabbit hole is that and I've talked about it before. Are these deep sea CCTV cameras? Where you can go and just yeah. pick up the live feeds on these like deep sea cameras, man. Talk, talk. It, what it, you know what it reminds me of? I started the episode talking about QVC. It reminds me of QVC because I remember watching QVC going, "Okay, uh, I don't care about Walkman, but I'm going to stick around and see what the next thing is." You know, so you just watch these CCTV cameras, just hoping that you're the one that gets to see the gi- most giant Greenland shark ever just pass right by the camera. You know. Yeah. Waste a whole day. But uh what um what did you bring today? Well, 
<clears throat> Let's pretend like I didn't oversleep. <laughs> and I came extremely prepared. Yes. So I was like, hey, I bet there was there's some interesting articles from Silence Day uh Science Daily. Oh yeah. It's a great source. And then I got to looking and I realized Science Daily is just for like mega nerds. Oh, yeah. Like, because some websites, some science websites have a, they have their fingers to the pulse of what straddles the line of cool and interesting and nerdy and scientific and nerdy and not necessarily exciting to anybody but people with phd yeah science daily is definitely you know the the headline for the day is breaking news scientists discover the sheer effect of plutonium electrons and you're like what <laughs> so i wanted to to uh read some science daily like big deals okay i feel like these are going to be tongue-in-cheek <laughs> oh yeah and this is big. This is big deal. This is exciting. Can, can you hear me still? Yes. You can't? Oh, because it just said my microphone was disconnected. And here's the thing about this first one that I'm going to read. Like, if you... There's a way to word this to make it cool and exciting. Like, wow, that's really fucking metal because... The idea here is interesting. It's just the way that they... Here's the headline. Swimming micro-robots deliver cancer-fighting drugs to metastatic lung tumors in mice. Oh, sounds promising. So... And the, the article is engineers have developed microscopic robots known as microbots capable of swimming through the lungs to deliver cancer-fighting medication directly to the metastatic tumors. Now, this is essentially, I believe, I don't know, if does this count as a nanorobots? Nanobots? Yeah, yeah, definitely. On that scale, yes. So when I think of nanobots, I immediately think of Jason X. Um, I don't know if you've seen Jason X. It's the, oh, yeah. the ninth install or the tenth installment in the Friday the thirteenth franchise. And in that movie, Jason X gets blown to bits by a, a sex robot, one of the worst movies in the entire franchise. And he gets rebuilt by nano robots. Is, he, is that the one where he so goes, I'm just thinking how So you go to space in that one? He goes, it's it's in space. The whole movie's in yeah, space. Yeah, yeah. It's the same movie where in the beginning they say the reason they're in space is because Earth is no longer ha inhabitable and is just a wasteland where nobody lives. And then at the end of the movie, uh, Jason Jason's hockey mask crashes into Crystal Lake and two teenagers are kissing in a perfectly normal world. Uh -huh. This happened in the same movie. Yeah. Yeah, no. <clears throat> uh, so there's a way to make this there's a way to make this really, really cool. Maybe you have a Jason X um, image. Micro robots are a real thing now. And you make it really, you can, you can make this interesting to non-nerds. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You could. I didn't even know we were at a level scientifically where we had nano robots. That could do this kind of stuff. They um the the this will blow your mind. Sometime look up um microscopic machines and just and all all you have to do is just also type in the, the number twenty thousand RPM and you'll find these these microscopic machines that are made of proteins <clears throat> that are geared like they've built them with gears and the thing spins parts of the parts of the motor that they've built spin at 20,000 RPM. And it's basically made up of, I don't know, microscopic meatballs, but they, they stay together. They spin. It's weird. What is its purpose? I think the purpose is to, sh well, if you think of it like on our scale, you know, a cat tractor down the road moves earths for a specific utility utility purpose 
imagine having small mechanisms that can do microscopic work. If you were to build those in mass, they could if they could really affect change within a, a human body or a, a, a organic organic thing. I don't know. I'm not smart. <laughs> You are the kind of guy that reads this website headliners and goes, oh, yeah, though. Yeah. Oh, Teresa. Yeah. Teresa in the back door. Nano motors. Yeah. Look up nano motors. And that's you'll. you'll OK. It's crazy. Here's another one. Towards a new era in flexible piezo piezoelectric sensors for both humans and robots. See. I know just reading that headline towards, towards a new era in flexible piezoelectric sensors for both humans and robots. I know from that headline that there's something fucking cool there. I'll bet if you read the article, I just don't know what it is. It'll probably talk about heart transplants or or pacemakers because piezoelectric sensors are the kind of sensors that can detect micro pulses within our nerves and that kind of stuff. So if they, I figured, you know, so we're talking new prosthetics that are based on ultra sensitivity to the nerves that would be going to a severed arm, you know, that kind of a thing. That's crazy. Here's one that's right up your alley op. AI powered simulation training improves human performance in robotic exoskeletons. Wait, say it, read it again. Right? <laughs> That's not how you do headlines. <laughs> you just proved my point. <laughs> AI-powered simulation training improves human performance in robotic exoskeletons. Okay. All right, so AI is helping to improve the 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 function of the 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 robot exoskeleton that she drives in Alien. You know, that kind oh, of God thing. Sigourney. Yeah. The, oh, this is wild. So the, this guy, this this company invented these braces that go around your knees, and they provide just a subtle amount of of motor to offset the the part of our walk or run cycle where our legs take the most weight. And so these motors offset that weight that our, our legs usually handle. And they're like, we just 10 X the amount of time distance somebody could run or climb a mountain or anything. Cause like, and it's not like, you know, it's not like a juke, juke, juke kind of motor. Yeah. It's just a motor that just offsets the muscle effort just enough where it's like, there you go. Climb Everest now. Crazy. Sweet. The Army should get them in 10 years, <laughs> and the Marine Corps should get them in 300. <laughs> well, that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> hey, did you see... Uh, uh, just a quick tangent since you mentioned it. Did you see that the draft is coming back? Well, that's fun. Yeah. I think you just right. aged out, though, so you're okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I, I fatted out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the, they're bringing the draft back? Yeah, they're bringing back. Well, they're bringing back the, um, you know how... Uh, the. No, it's, it's the, what, uh, why did I just lose the word? When you turn 18. Selective service? Yeah, selective service. They're, they're yeah. opening that back up or opening it wider. Uh, it includes women now. Oh, I, I, no, finish what you, okay, finish what you're doing. Then I'll, I'll say this. I keep interrupting you. I'm sorry. So now my daughters have to enlist in the selective service. Possible. Possible. Also, this kind of thing usually happens when we're when we're in a war or, you know, so that's a weird that's a weird flex by the government. That's a little concerning. I would I would because I feel like they probably know some stuff that we don't. Maybe. I don't know. 
I'm going to ignore it. I'm not. This has ruined my morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. And <clears throat> I mean, I'm just thinking now with the uh, go out and grab, even if it was just males. Yeah. Even if the selective service didn't require females to enlist, to sign up for it, and you just grabbed a random 18-year-old male off the street, <laughs> what does he, what does he look like? He's got a perm. Soft hands. And he's like, very, the softest hands. <laughs> the soft, his hands fell, feel like the belly of a mouse. <laughs> He, 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 I don't know if you ever felt, felt a mouse belly. It's the sweetest little thing, and you just want to rub your cheek on it. <laughs> yeah, House bill, uh, this was three days ago. House passes defense bill automatically registering men 18 to 26 for the draft. Um, I, sh I, I did see women in a couple of the things, but that might be just people, uh, you know, trying to make a mountain out of a molehill. But yeah, it's definitely a thing. Oh, this is very concerning. Here we go. Selective service. Wow. Women registrations proposed men to be automatically drafted. So, so yeah. Fun times. We can't turn off the feminism now. Well, technically, you might not need to because the men that we're talking, that we just described, I don't know. You know, at a hundred feet, yeah. it looks like a woman. <laughs> that's a good, that's a fair, actually, I think women are harder than men nowadays. It might be better yeah. actually to turn off selective service for men and make it all women. Cause I think that's a stronger military exactly. in 2024, honestly. Yeah. 2025 becomes this is concerning, man. year one in the GI generation, you know, just <sighs> Oh no! <laughs> this is you. Really did ruin my morning. I, I I know you think I'm kidding. I'm not. I find this very upsetting. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. Here we go. I'd like to meet the one guy that got excited over this headline, just to pick his brain with an axe. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the headline. Origins of fast radio bursts come into focus through polarized lot. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to who reads that and goes, "Ooh." Okay, wait. Click. No. Okay, wait. <laughs> so, there are objects in the sky. Uh, in, oh, for, I knew it. In particular, I knew it. So there are these objects called magnetars, and they're they're planet sized objects that are spinning so fast, like we're talking a ridiculous speed, that they that they emit this just immensely massive radio burst of uh, burst of radio waves. And we have we haven't been able to detect them all that well. There's a, there's a handful of different planetary objects or solar objects that do this kind of thing. Right. Um, but being able to detect oh, and another reason we can't detect them is if you imagine giving a kid with uh, with uh, uh, grand mal seizures, give them a flashlight and put them in the woods, uh, and then try to find them. And the only way you'd find them is because they have seizures, you'd only see the light. Like they're holding the flashlights like this, but you're only seeing the light through the trees like once every, you know, every bit. So that's why the magnetars yeah. are spinning so fast, and the 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 radio waves emit from the poles, and so the pole oh, wow. only comes directed at the Earth every once in a while. And the and uh, but it's consistent, so it's it creates a, a radio pulse, 
And so we huh. can start detecting these objects that are out there that visibly we can't see with light, but that the radio pulses are hitting us. And we're like, okay. And then we can target it based on where that pulse has come from. Anyway, I'm right. super excited about it. <laughs> I, I feel like I owe you an apology. <laughs> I feel like I owe you an apology. You... I, I, I really thought that that headline sounded boring, but after you explained it, it's even worse than I thought it was. <laughs> I know. I know. Hey, you have heard, though, about the new explosion that's going to be in the sky soon. That'll it, It'll look like a, a really big, bright star. Yeah. Yeah. Once every 80 years, this uh, pul- pulsar? No. Is it a pulsar? I can't remember. There's this one uh, celestial object that, that bursts like blows up it it builds all the energy up and then it explodes and it'll show up like a north star like that bright in the sky it's supposed to happen like literally any time uh and all these astronomers have their eyes trained on the on the star or the the part in the sky waiting for it to happen god damn that is wild stuff i know that is fucking wild stuff. God damn. I am really trying hard to not admit that that places like Science Daily aren't on my regular toilet read lists. I'm trying very hard. <laughs> I'm trying to think. The only time that I read um the only time that I read a book that isn't true crime related for research yeah like the only time i'm reading for something that isn't work is on the toilet i always keep a book on the back of the toilet that i work that i read while i'm doing a poop Uh and why did jess act like that's disgusting (laughs) why did she just make that face i don't know why why was that why is that unmute yourself what is wrong with me reading while I poop? All the germs on that book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Good point. I hadn't even thought about that, but that's very it's fair. Like, uh, yeah, people that have those suction. Then I sell it at a yard sale. <laughs> Poopy book. <laughs> a month later, yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. That's fair. It's like uh, <laughs> people that have the sticky things on the back of their phone, like those Octo Buddies, like the oh yeah that stick. On something like think of all the germs you're picking up off the surface <laughs> and then putting to your face. Yeah, yeah. like imagine Kent. Yeah. Uh, you know, think of Kent Wipe. wiping Next and then explaining to you that the book he's reading is a real page turner. <laughs> <laughs> the the guy that buys so it that- at the garage sale is patient zero <laughs> in the next plague. <laughs> Like you wonder where flesh eating bacteria, like how that spreads, but Mommy, Daddy, why is this one called the Louis Lamour plague? <laughs> okay, you need to hit the fucking brakes because you use a bidet. Okay, you <laughs> splash yourself with hot shit water <laughs> and then walk away for some reason feeling refreshed. <laughs> Mateo in the background said, I love the smell of old books. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, man. <coughs> um, <laughs> I'm never going to smell a book the What same. if that's secretly, we don't know it, there hasn't been any studies done, what if that's why old books smell the way they are, because of poop readers? <laughs> that's what's been adding the old book smell this whole time, we just weren't aware People of it. Like, I love the old the smell of an old bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> my cheeks hurt. I stopped now. taking my phone in the bathroom for that reason because I had this realization that you're like sitting in there with your poop particles. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, that and yeah, you you realize your poop is finished in one percent of the time that it was prior to taking the phone into the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I dumb phoned my phone yesterday. I just got tired of all the apps and all the time, so I just took everything off again. And now I don't have anything. I go into the bathroom. I'm only in there for like thirty seconds. <laughs> well, and Teresa in the back door said, "What 
think about your toothbrush. This is the exact reason I do not brush my teeth or keep my toothbrush in the bathroom. Oh, that's a good point. It stays in a kit. Yeah. And where do you the brush kitchen? them at? You, you, so you, you're saying huh. that if your toothbrush is within earshot of your toilet, or if just your anything in the bathroom, sitting on the countertop in an open cup, like people put their yeah. toothbrush in a cup, right? We do. And you're yeah. pooping yeah. in that bathroom. There are now yeah. poop particles. It's human airborne. That's a good point. That's why I call my toothbrush the shit stick. <laughs> <laughs> Girls, uh, I'm sorry, Kent. We hijacked your uh, sorry, your list read with my OCD. No, <laughs> I'm done, and I'm enjoying this more than I was what I was reading anyway. So my contamination OCD. <laughs> uh, well, I brought something interesting today. Um, man, why is it when I know that I'm about to bring up a topic, I can, I can, I already have predicted what everyone's going to do. Jess is going to get on Amazon or Target.com and do some shopping. Kent's going to pretend like he's having an aneurysm and Chase, well, Chase will just do what Chase normally does and sit there, sit there peace, peacefully zenning out. But I, uh, just two days ago, there was a coin discovery that's... Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to blow your mind. <laughs> we'll see. So in a, in a place called Lod, L-O-D, Lod, Israel, uh, there, is, there was a discovery made just the other day that sheds a new light on a really critical part of Jewish history. So uh, uh, big, big, big explanation for this time period was this is this is the time period in Jewish history where the Jewish people were under Roman rule. So this would include like Jesus and, but you know, a long time before and a good, good amount of time after. <clears throat> so archeologists have unearthed a 1700 year old stash of silver and bronze coins that were hidden during the final Jewish revolt against Roman rule. So it was found in the ruins of a public building uh, from the late Roman, early Byzantine era. Um, so Lod, this, this place, known uh, to the, Rum the Romans as Dio Diospolis, was a city at the heart of the Jewish resistance. So the Israel, Israel Antiquities Authority, the, or the IAA, announced the fine, revealing 94 coins dating from A.D. 221 to A.D. 350. No, A.D. 221 to 354. These coins were likely hidden in anticipation of the catastrophic events surrounding the, Ga the Gaius Revolt. Gallus Revolt, maybe. A turbulent period from A.D. 351 to 354. So during this time, Jews rose against Flavius Claudius Constantius, Constantius Gallus, a relative of Constantine the Great. Uh, so the archaeologists believe the building, uh, although it was violently, de violently destroyed during the actual revolt, but the building protected the hordes. So the coins were deliberately placed within the foundation of the building and perhaps left behind by someone who hoped to return once the chaos subsided. You know, sort of that, uh, that, uh, like the movie prison. Wow. Prison movie. What happened to my brain? You know, hide the, hide your treasure near a tree. Um, <clears throat> there's a guy at the IAA named Moore Wiesel. I think he's related to Vin Diesel. Um, he's like the cool coin relative of Vin Diesel. Uh, he's with the IAA. He describes uh, that a, quote, emergency hoard was hidden with the intention of retrieval in calmer times. So the Gallus Revolt. More Wiesel is a female. <clears throat> oh, dang it. <laughs> is she tough looking? Uh, looks super Jewy. <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Good-looking lady. 
Sorry about that, Moore. Ah, dang it. Yeah, she's attractive. Yeah. That smile on her face says she's she's excited about Looks the coins. Looks evil. It's like, <laughs> I got the coins. So the Gallus Revolt saw widespread destruction. Laud was not alone in its suffering. Cities like the uh, Tiberius and Sephoris. Uh, weird that Sephoris was destroyed back then, and we're destroying Sephoras now through looting. So there's a full circle for you. Uh, uh, but the Romans... Uh, Wiped out those cities, too. So this revolt, revolt was part of a long history of Jewish resistance. So the first Jewish-Roman War, uh, A.D. 66 to A.D. 70, so it lasted four years, ended with the Romans destroying the Second Temple. Uh, later, I th And I don't know the whole story behind the Second Temple, but I'm guessing there was a First Temple. And then they were wow. looking for an easy name, so they named this one. <clears throat> Second Temple, similar to how I'm going to name my first boat, Unsinkable 2. Uh, anyway, later, during the Bar Kokhba Revolt, uh, 132 to 135, the Romans brutally crushed the Jews uh, and, and that were hoping for independence. So there's this aerial view of the ruins in Lod that shows uh, all the extent of the destruction that had happened during this during this conflict between the Jews and the Romans. And according to, according to the excavators there, there's a couple of excavators, Shahar Crispin and Moore, Wiesel, uh, the building's destruction uh, down to its foundation uh, really hits home how, how intense this conflict was uh, and the Roman response to it some may say you know overreach why do they have to crush the building down to its foundation you know how many children are lost questions um this was a, a very decisive oh. and violent suppression we'll be having this exact Talmudic same writings. conversation i'm sorry we'll just i was gonna say we'll be having this exact same conversation in a thousand years only about palestine yeah. If possible. <laughs> yep. And I'll be the one talking about the coins that we found from Palestine, you know? So that'll be fun. And the weird thing will be all the coins that they pull out of Palestine during this time will be U.S. coins. <laughs> and we'll all be androgynous. <laughs> uh, um... Some Talmudic writings, so those would be writings by the Talmud uh, or, or, or uh, Jewish writings, highlight Lod significant as a Jewish significance as a Jewish center after the Second Temple's fall. So, alongside the coins, researchers discovered some impressive stone and marble artifacts with inscriptions in Greek and Hebrew and Latin. One item that st they're still studying. Uh, bears the name of a Jewish man from a priestly family. However, the exact use of the building before its destruction remains pretty unclear. Might have served multiple purposes, like maybe a synagogue or study hall or a meeting place for elders or like a dance hall for Dance Dance Revolution. Um, there's going to be a big presentation of the coins and all that stuff presented at the Central Israel Region Archaeological Conference in Tel Aviv on June 20th, two days away, if you can make it. Uh, pretty cool, actually, though. I mean, that kind of a hoard isn't discovered every day, so uh, especially that old. How much do you think this is worth? Ooh, priceless, actually. It it. Some things, when you find them, they exceed a value and then just become the property of a country based on its society, its historical lineage. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Like you couldn't put a price on Queen Nefertiti's bust. You know, you, you can't price right. it because it's it just those things were huge. Or King Tut's tomb you know you can't price it out uh that's what i meant 
How many coins were there total? Uh, 1,700 year old stash. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, eight, two. Nine. Give me 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if it said, I think, ni- oh, 94, 94 coins. 94. So that's pretty good. You know, you, they're really well made. Yeah, for especially like, I don't know about you, but what was it? Well, I was going to say, especially for the time. I mean, I would be interested in seeing the <clears throat> process to making these, how they made them. Yeah, you know, yeah, seventeen hundred years ago. Yeah, there was a. I'm always intrigued by you know when they find a shipwreck and the coins that come off the shipwrecks. You know. Uh, there was one that sunk a good while back, I believe in the 80s, called the Atocha. And it's one of the most famous shipwrecks because of the amount of gold that was on that was found on the ship. And you can find you can find replica coins of uh, coins that came off of the Atocha. And boy, they're just so ornate and beautiful. Oh, I always yeah, like that stuff. Them now. Wild stuff. Anyway, good stuff, Op. Brought the house down with that one. So, well, I mean, I've got to be honest with you. I've got some sharks to track. Yeah, you got to track sharks. I've got to go eat lunch. So, and then after that, I think I might go read a book for 15 or 20 minutes. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> Jess, did you have something you wanted to say? <laughs> she got all, she got all ready like a wind up you know, batter and then mutes herself again. (laughs) Yeah. She pulled the mic in, she unmuted herself, pulled the mic in and then muted herself. (laughs) I had Chad GBT write an improv skit about a man sitting in a bathroom reading books. (laughs) Well, obviously you got to read it. Oh no, we'll do it on another never daily. You guys can play the, the actors. Okay. All right. We'll do that. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, we got stuff to do. So um, on that note, soup, soup, everybody. Love you guys. Bye. This podcast is going to blow. So soup, soup, let's start the show.